welcome to operating systems lecture 40 right so we were discussing operating system organizations and let's review it so there are uh, you know there's a monolithic os organization that we've been used we are used to which is which has you know let's look at the unix abstractions the file system virtual memory scheduler drivers all live in one common address space that's called the kernel and then these uh, different modules uh, export syst system call apis like read write open close um, mmap, uh, page fault, uh, et cetera, right? So these are all uh, sort of abstractions that these things provide. Then there was an alternate organization which is called the microkernel, where these different components are moved in separate prediction domains. For example, they are run as separate servers. These servers could be running as separate processes uh, in unprivileged mode, or they could be running as separate pro processes in privileged mode. In either case, they're isolated from each other. And what the kernel is basically is just an inter-process communication, IPC, and protection. So nobody can run away with resources, and it, the job of the kernel is really to provide fast inter-process communication. Right? So this has the advantage that it's very plug, plug and playable, pluggable and playable. You can choose your file system, you can choose your virtual memory subsystem, depending on what you want to run. You can actually say, here is my virtual memory subsystem, why don't you run this one? instead of that one. Of course, there are some, uh, some issues there that, you know, that virtual memory subsystem should be trusted, maybe signed by some uh, certificate authority, et cetera, but, but it's possible to do this, right? The other thing is, of course, if there's a bug or if there's a security flaw in one of these things, let's say there's a security flaw in the driver, it doesn't affect the security of the full, full system. It just affects one container, and so uh, faults are not propagated, okay? And then we were looking at another type of microkernel that's called the exokernel. Here the idea is that you expose as much information, low level information as possible from the kernel to the application. And all these different subsystems like the file system, virtual memory scheduler, uh, even the drivers are part of the application logic. Okay? So for example, the application can decide what the application knows that there is a physical address space and there's a, a virtual address space, and it can decide what should be the footprint of my uh, of my application or my code on the physical address space, and what should be the footprint in the virtual address space, and what should the mapping be. In other words, it can decide what the replacement algorithm should be, when should I take a page fault, etc., and uh, and so on. Right. Similarly, in the file system case it can choose what file system it likes. So instead of exposing open, read, write, close calls to the application, how about exposing the device interface, sort of like the disk interface to the application, right? So tell the application that, look, you have access to a disk, a raw disk. And so you can write to sector number 10 and so on. And you choose, you know, what uh, layout you want on this part of the disk. Of course, that has problems, you know, what about sharing, et cetera. But those can be, you know, built on top of that. So how, how do different processes share files, et cetera? That can be built on top of that. But at the end of the day, the kernel is not involved in implementing the file system. The kernel is only involved in providing an abstraction that allows the application to build a file system on top of it, right? And so that makes things very configurable. An application can choose what file system it wants. And I was using the example of a database. Uh, you know, a database does not like, uh, so for example, a database may want very strong persistence guarantees. So if it has written something to a disk block, it needs to be sure that the disk block is actually present on the magnetic platter before it actually, you know, prints a message or releases the money or something like that, right? So these kind of guarantees, if you, if you provide on top of a regular operating system like Unix, you will need to do system calls like F-Sync. And those, because there's multiple layers, they know those layers don't interact very well with each other. The overall performance of the system is not optimal. But if you have this kind of a system, then an application can actually tune. You know, there's no, you have gotten rid of the layers, the multiple layers. You are saying that the application can choose. Uh, chalk? Yeah. No, I don't have it. I don't think so. Okay, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Sorry. So the application can choose 
what uh, what fi uh, what file system abstraction it wants. So there's only one file system abstraction. Okay. So um, okay, let's look at. So you may say, oh, but you know that's too much headache for the application developer. Does that mean if I want to implement a small application, I need to implement a full file system and a virtual memory subsystem before I can get Hello World to run? Well, the answer to that is very simple. You just use libraries, right? So you have standard libraries. For example, you have you use uh, you know you have a library that implements the ext3 file system. It's a user level library, right? That implements the ext3 file system using the abstractions provided by the kernel. Most applications may want to just use the ext3 user level library, but let's say your application is a database application. It says I don't want to use the ext3 uh, library. I want to use my own sort of uh, library. So this flexibility is possible because you are giving lower level interfaces to the application as opposed to higher level interfaces to the application. Yes? Would there be too much overhead like every app will be having some of the information about the... Okay, won't there be too much overhead? Interesting. Won't there be too much overhead? Why, why do you think there will be too much overhead? You say, why? Oh, well, every app will have its private copy of the file system code. Every uh, uh, process will have a co private copy of the file system data, or similarly VM data, driver data. So isn't that too much overhead? Well, you know, you could argue there is some overhead, yes, because, but at the same time, you could share these things across processes, right? So processes can actually share address spaces. So libraries that are common to multiple processes can actually live in shared space, uh, can actually have one physical address copy and multiple uh, virtual address spaces can point to the same library copy. And these kind of optimizations are well known and we already know about them, right? So multiple processes, sharing libraries, sharing data are actually pointing to the same physical memory area. And so the space overhead is not much, right? Negligible, in fact. So when has to keep track of, like you said last time, for every app, bad, some app are Going, running away with right, so what the kernel has to do is firstly it has to design a low level API that allows all these applications to actually control these, uh, uh, these low level uh, interfaces, like low level devices for example, or low level disk or network or whatever, or CPU or memory. But the other thing it needs to do is basically implement protection. So these applications are not trusted, they are not trustworthy, and so an application should not be able to, for example, take to run away with the resources, or it should not be able to create mappings that are, it's not allowed to create, or it should not be able to write to blocks, disk blocks that it's not supposed to write to. Right, so those are small things that the kernel will ensure. So kernel's job is protection, and that's uh, for protection and low level implementation, implementation of low level API, that's all. So that way the kernel becomes much thinner than the original thing. Anyway, protection was there, right? If you, whether you put it a higher layer or you put it at a lower layer, how to implement protection? Here you implement protection at a lower layer. Sure, but in the previous case, we had like just a simpler abstraction uh, kind of protection for which was same for every app. Right? In this case, we have to keep records of which app are doing what. No, no. So the uh, so question is, in the previous case, in the monolithic kernel, the abstractions were identical for different processes. Here, the abstractions are not identical for different processes. That's not true. The abstractions are still identical for different processes. The abstractions are these low-level APIs. What's happening between the app and the v these layers, kernel doesn't care. So, sir, I'm saying the kernel has to keep track of whether the app is running for too long or did it yield when I requested it to. Okay, so you know the kernel has to keep track of how long the app has been running, but that's true even for monolithic, right? This is just slightly more complex. We're going to discuss it with more uh, examples. Let's look at this. So we were looking at the exokernel VM example and say, said, okay, so because unlike Unix, where the application has no idea that there's something called a physical address space, the application only knows about a virtual address space, right? And it's the operating system that's basically uh, ma create, um, managing this mapping between the virtual address space and the physical address space. In the exokernel, you actually expose this entire uh, mapping to the application, and you can uh, and the interface that you give is so there the are down calls, which are you know system calls basically that the application can make. So you can allocate a physical address page, and you can deallocate a physical page. So notice that I'm saying PA, which basically means physical address. So the application knows that it's a physical address page. So application has full knowledge about what's the footprint 
in the physical memory, what's its footprint in the physical memory. In Unix, an application has no idea. Right? It's the OS who is managing how much uh, physical uh, in footprint you have. And then there is this uh, down call called create mapping from virtual address to physical address. Of course, you know, there are some protection mechanisms and the uh, kernel must ensure to make sure that it can only create mappings to physical addresses that it owns, right? Or it has allocated, right? So, so, so that it, there's no security problem of that sort. And then there are up calls. Up calls are similar to signals in Unix where the kernel can actually uh, ask the application to execute some code, and there's some entry points that the, kernel, the application must have pre-registered, and so some up calls are page fault. So the kernel tells the application that there's a page fault on this virtual address, and the application can decide that it wants to alloc one more physical address, physical page, and then create this mapping, and then resume the ex execution. In doing so, it may want to first de-alloc some other physical address space, because you know the application the kernel is not allowing you to alloc more than a certain number of physical address spaces, et cetera. And then, so that's page fault. And the other thing that the kernel will want to make sure is that the application cannot just run away with this memory. And so in this case, let's say there are other applications that are running and you want to do some kind of fair allocation of the memory, then the kernel can make an up call saying, please release the page. So notice that this is unlike Unix where the kernel would just take away the page. It will run some algorithm internally to figure out which page to take, and just take it away, right? Without that, without consulting the application at all, and that was the problem, right? The problem was that I was not consulting the application. The application was perhaps the best judge of which page to actually throw away, right? And whether it needs to be written to the swap device or not, okay? In this case, you just tell the application, "I want you to release a page," and so the application then, you know, chooses which page to release, and then calls dialog page on that particular page. And then you can, you know, to make sure that this is, uh, this is safe, you can have another Cisco, uh, up call which, say, which says, you know, re force release a page and you give a particular physical address that I'm releasing this. And, if, and he, should, he, should, he better honor that. If he does not honoring that, he'll probably get a sec fault very soon, right? Yes. But there might be some algorithms which are better at a global level. For example, the disk, disk scheduler. Now, for example, you said that in elevator kind of thing, uh, in the elevator algorithm, if we have a pre knowledge of the sectors which we need to read, we can proceed in more efficient ways. Okay. Now, in this case, every uh, uh, now in this case, every application will be running its own disk schedule algorithm. So okay. Will this be a problem? Okay. So the so fair point. Question is. The some algorithms or some policies that are best implemented at a global level and not at a local level. Right? For example, may I want to run my page replacement algorithm at a global level. Right? That may be the most efficient thing to do, as opposed to say that uh, I want to give, uh, take a page from you and you decide which page to give. Right? I may want to consider all the pages across all the processes at a global pool and then choose the one that's least recently used, let's say. In this case, I'm, you know, I'm basically pre-committing to a process that uh, this is the process I want to take a page from, and then I make an up call saying, please release the page. So isn't, there's a, isn't there a, an inefficiency there? Well, yes, I mean, so there's a trade-off. Firstly, notice that there's, there are two kinds of policies here. One is the policy that the application will implement internally, and then there's another policy at the OS level, anyways, which is choosing which process to ask. Right? So it already the, the, the kernel knows that each process has these many pages, so there's, there are two levels of uh, policies. And so there's still a policy inside the, inside the kernel that cannot be overridden, which basically saying, which is a global policy. Right? So it's, what the exokernel is doing is separating the global policy from the local policy. He's saying, let, ha, let's, let the application have the flexibility to at least decide the local policy. Global policy is still in the hands of the kernel. For example, it'll, choose, it'll say which process to give this up call to. Right? So that, that's the global policy. Similarly, you know, any other shared device, like the disk, you, you took the example of disk scheduling, same thing, right? So there's a, there's a global policy engine running in the kernel level, but you are giving the application the flexibility to at least decide the local policy. You're right, the application can still have no control over the global policy. Perfectly fine, perfectly valid point. Okay, let's take another example. Exo kernel CPU. So, you know, you have down calls like yield and block, these are similar to Unix, where you basically say, I want to yield the CPU. By yield, you mean I want to stop running on the CPU. Somebody else can run. 
At the same time, I'm ready to run. So if there's nobody else to run, I can, you know, I can be rescheduled back. And block basically means that I'm blocked. So you know, till I'm woken up by somebody, I'm not available to run. These are similar. But the interesting thing is up calls. Unlike Unix, where, it, where the uh, kernel would just take away the CPU from the application. And we saw some problems with that, right? So the, 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 the kernel can just say, I need the CPU back. Just take it away, right? So irrespective of where the application was in its execution, you could just take away the CPU from the application. And there was a problem with that. Let's say the application was actually holding a spin lock, right? And now within the critical section, the CPU was taken away from the application. Then all the other processes, which were you know, uh, depending on the spin lock, will just waste their time spinning on this spin lock for the time quantum, right? So that would have, that was, we used that example at the schedule when we were discussing scheduling. Right? And that problem was basically because the application had no control over when there was a context switch. Here, you're going to make an up call instead, asking the application to please release the CPU. The nice thing about this is when you ask, ask the application to say, please release the CPU, the application knows that I'm in the middle of a critical section. It can, it can actually execute the minimum number of instructions required to come out of the critical section, and then call yield. Right? That's a much better scheduling uh, paradigm than what we saw in, uh, in Unix, right? So it doesn't have this problem of uh, getting interrupted in the middle of a critical section. And so everybody else just keeps wasting the CPU because it just spins on the, on, the, on the lock. Also, you can, you know, the application knows exactly which registers to save. So let's say, you know, the application is just using three registers. So the, when, when it actually calls yield, it just needs to save those three registers before it actually says, I want to yield the CPU. Similarly, there's an up call called resume CPU. So unlike Unix, where when you resume, you just start from where you preempted the process last time, right? In case of, uh, in case, in the, in the case of exokernel, you'll instead make an up call calling, saying resume CPU. And so up call is going to go to a certain point in the application, and the resume CPU up call will know exactly which registers to reload, depending on which registers were saved in my previous yield call. Right, so you have saved on the amount of data that you need to save and restore also. But the data is being stored by the user program itself. That data is being stored by the user program itself, yes. So the, it's the user program's responsibility to save and restore its own data, right? As opposed to, and, and it has this flex, you know, you can give it that flexibility because you are making, you know, you, you are requesting uh, and resuming through, uh, you're giving him control over it as opposed to Unix where you would just take it away and give it back, in which case it becomes a kernel's responsibility to save everything. But, uh, is, is that much of an advantage because anyways only a small overhead of Is that much of an advantage? Well, you know, yeah, uh, registers are very small. It's not, it's not a big deal, really. But you know, in certain cases, it may be uh, uh, a significant advantage. But I think the, main, the most important thing is the scheduling uh, point that I discussed, which is basically that uh, you don't have problems like the convoy effect, where basically you, if one process gets uh, interrupted in the middle of a critical section, then there's a very bad scheduling behavior that you can get. OK, good. All right, so with that, I'm going to move to my next topic, which is, um, which is virtualization. Okay, this is a somewhat uh, relatively modern topic. Are there practical examples of exokernels? Well, um, so exokernels were first proposed in late 90s uh, as a research paper. And, um, and you know, many ideas from the exokernel paper have been used in modern kernels, uh, especially in the modern kernels where we are basically looking at uh, kernels that scale across lot, lots of CPUs, like 60, 60 to 80 CPUs, you know, these kind of ideas are actually uh, uh, proving very useful. And so uh, many ideas from the exokernel uh, paper are being used in modern kernels, especially research kernels today, which are targeting uh, large uh, multi-core CPU uh, machines. Okay. All right. So let's uh, talk about virtualization. So so far, we saw that there was a kernel, 
and then there was a process. All right? And there was an abstraction between the process and the kernel. And this abstraction was designed so that the process can do what it wants to do and also it's safe. This abstraction depended, depended on the kernel. It depends on the OS, let's say. For example, Windows will have a different abstraction from Linux. Linux version 2.2 will have a different abstraction from Linux version 3.0 and so on. So these abstractions are relatively very fluid. It's very difficult to take a process that would run on uh, Linux 3.0 and make it run on Linux 2.2. Even more difficult to take a process that runs on Windows and uh, uh, make it run on, some, on Linux, let's say, or vice versa. Right? So all these things are you know, relatively difficult. Also, it's very difficult. So let's say I have two machines. A process has lots of bindings with the kernel. For example, it has a file descriptor table, it has virtual memory, etc. So it's very difficult to migrate processes between live between two different machines. So you have two different machines running two different kernels. Let's say they're even running the same kernel. You know, I, I cannot just take a process here and just say, you know, let's run it here, let's start running it here. You know, I cannot take a running process here and then start resume and resume it on the other side because a lot of the state of the process is actually inside the kernel. And there's a lot of state that a process can have. Uh, and you know, so far we have seen, given that it's a monolithic kernel, a monolithic kernel has a file system, a virtual memory subsystem, and so there are all kinds of data structures that are living inside the kernel. And so all those data structures need to be migrated as well. And that seems like a very hard problem. All right. So, so virtual uh, so virtual machines is a concept which says let this uh, abstraction that I'm calling a process be somewhat equal to the hardware abstraction machine abstraction. If I could do this efficiently. Then you know the abstraction that I have with the uh, with whatever is uh, running uh, beneath it. Let's call it the kernel for now. Is going to be simply that of a CPU, a raw disk, uh, devices like the disk controller, right? Network card, network interface, and so on and physical memory and virtual memory subsystem, which whatever the hardware supports. For example, um, you know, all the registers like CR3, which is, the page, which is pointing to the page table, So what if the abstraction that the kernel provides to the process is identical to the abstraction that the kernel sees itself on the hardware, right? So the kernel is written to assume a certain abstraction, which is a hardware abstraction. The hardware abstraction is there's a CPU that runs one instruction after another. It has a certain instruction set. Jump uh, allows you to change the program counter and so on. There are memory accesses. And then there is a virtual memory subsystem, which can be controlled by going through CR3, and you can configure page tables. There are devices, hardware devices, that can be accessed using in and out instructions, and so on. Right? This is an interface that the hardware provides, and is specified in the hardware manual of the manufacturer. Can the same interface be the one that the kernel provides to the process? And if it is able to do this efficiently, then the interface between the process and the application and the kernel becomes much more solid or much more, um, much more compact and much, more, much less fluid in the sense that hardware abstractions seldom change or change at a much slower pace than the kernel abstraction change. Right? You get a kernel version every few months, but the hardware version changes at a much slower rate. 
Moreover, hardware preserves what's called backward compatibility. You know, anything that you could have done on a previous generation of a processor or a previous generation of a disk controller will run on the new generation of the disk controller and so on. Right? So if you could do that, then this abstraction becomes relatively solid. And so it will be possible to uh, take a process and you know, run it on a different kernel. And so you basically know that the state that this process has is very compact. It consists of the physical memory footprint, the page tables, the disk contents, and um, the network interface con uh, state, and other registers. Right? So these are, this is basically, you can draw a line, and then this is exactly the state of this process. And if I can save it and restore it somewhere else, I can migrate this process from one machine to another. All right? And I can also migrate it across different versions of the kernel. Okay, so this, this abstraction is called the virtual machine abstraction. Okay, because it's just a machine that's, that's implemented in a virtual manner in, the, in a process container. And so you could run multiple virtual machines on one physical machine. Right? It's just like running multiple processes on one kernel, except that the abstraction is, has changed. Okay, the abstraction is not no longer of that of a Unix process. The abstraction is that of a machine, of a hardware that you're providing it. Does it mean that we are exposing all the hardware to the process directly or, uh, or not? So well, I mean, firstly, just like Unix could not trust its processes, we don't want to trust our virtual machines. Right? So you cannot just expose the hardware directly. And the question is, how does one implement these virtual machines efficiently? Okay. So let me just also say that these, these containers are called virtual machines, and the kernel is called the virtual machine monitor. If I'm doing something like this, firstly, let's understand what are the advantages of doing something like this. The advantages of doing something like this are, firstly, because the, the abstraction of the container is very solid, it's very well defined. It's written in the hardware manual. And it's basically something that has a guarantee of backward compatibility. You can actually take a virtual machine container and move it at will to some other virtual machine monitor and still expect it to run it exactly like it was running in the previous machine. Right? So you can actually do migration across different uh, machines, uh, which would be a harder, harder thing to do for something as amorphous as a Unix process, all right? So it can, it's actually a very good fit for a distributed system where you can imagine that you have different, lots of different machines and you can take one virtual machine and just decide where to schedule this process, right? You can schedule it on this physical machine or you can schedule it on that physical machine and so on. It also allows you to do other interesting things. For example, you could run a full operating system within this container, right? So you could install let's say, a Linux system and spawn a, a virtual machine and install a Windows operating system inside that virtual machine. Because the abstraction is exactly that of the hardware, the Windows operating system running inside this container will never actually know that's actually running inside a virtual machine. Because it'll see exactly the same abstractions that would have seen at the hardware level, right? So there are, there are lots of advantages to doing this. And this, and this virtualization forms the building block of what's, uh, what's also called as cloud computing. So I'm going to discuss that more a little bit in a little bit. But let's first discuss how virtual machines are implemented. Right? So it comes to your question. Firstly, I need to implement them in some efficient manner. Otherwise, the whole thing is uh, not, not, not practical. So what's the simplest way to implement virtual machines? Well, one, one way to implement virtual machines is interpretation, or interpreter-based. We just write an interpreter, which basically, uh, de you know, which basically behaves exactly like what your hardware does, and just takes one instruction, executes it, takes the next instruction, executes it, and so on, right? And so, you basically have an interpreter, and you run this uh, uh, the the code of the machine, which is which is executable now, 
inside this interpreter and this, uh, this code should run, right? So for example, uh, software like Box is, is a virtual machine monitor, could be called a virtual machine monitor, uh, in, at least in the definition that we have so far, except that it's too slow, right? It's going to take one instruction from the process, it's going to decode it, it's going to see what registers it accesses, it's going to emulate those registers in memory, it's going to perform this operation, and then go to the next instruction, and so on, right? So it's an interpreter loop. Each instruction has to internally uh, execute 50 to 100 more instructions, and so this has an overhead of 50 to 100 X. Notice that this interpretation-based approach is completely safe. The, you don't need to expose raw hardware to the, to the executable. The executable sees virtual hardware. And this virtual hardware is a virtual CPU. You could emulate a virtual device, like a virtual network card, and so on. And they are basically just talking to this virtual network card with the same interface that you would have had for a physical network card. Right? And the virtual network card internally is using, let's say, system calls uh, exported by the virtual machine monitor to actually send packets on the physical wire. Okay, so that's a that's an interpretation based uh, virtual machine monitor. It's really slow, but solve, it's completely safe. I don't need to trust anything. The other approach is basically what's called binary translation. Here, the idea is that. If there's a piece of code that gets executed 100 times or a million times, uh, that's more likely, then uh, you don't need to run the interpreter loop every time you see that instruction. You can take those, let's say, you can take those 100 instructions and translate them to some safe counterpart, and then execute those 100 instructions, uh, you know, execute the translated counterpart a million times, right? So it's a, it's a fast way of doing interpretation. Let's say it's a fast interpreter. or faster interpreter, where basically instead of taking an instruction every time, decoding it, and performing its operations, you, uh, you translate that instruction into the operations that need to be performed each time that instruction gets executed, and you just jump to the translation. Right? That's basically. Uh, and an example of this kind of uh, a system is QMU, which is basically, which, which you've used in your assignments. I give this roughly 5 to 10x overheads, okay? So it's an improvement over something like Box, but it's still not good enough, right? I won't use something like QMU to run uh, virtual machines for which I care about performance. So because they have such high overheads, these, these, uh, these software systems are not called virtual machine monitors. So the additional requirement on a virtual machine monitor is that the performance overhead of virtualization should be very small. It cannot be, it should be in some percentage points. It cannot be uh, 5 to 10x, for example. Okay. So the third way of, and the most common way of doing virtualization is what's called trap and emulate. Okay. So what's done here is, here um, you allow So before I go, go forward, let me also point out that in both these approaches, interpreter and binary translation, I could have run a virtual machine for one architecture on the physical machine of another architecture. Nothing stops me from doing that, right? I could run the virtual machine for the x86 architecture on a physical machine for PowerPC architecture, right? Because I'm just completely emulating the x86 architecture on PowerPC. It doesn't matter you know, what the underlying uh, machine is. So would the monitor would be modified accordingly? Well, the monitor you know, will be modified accordingly in the sense that, let's say, if you're writing it in a higher level language like C, then it should be compiled for PowerPC. That's all. Right? If the underlying machine is PowerPC, then you will compile it for PowerPC. That's all. Otherwise, the mo monitor remains the same. OK? But something like uh, trap and emulate allows only uh, virtualization of same architecture. So which basically means that you can only run the, uh, 
the virtual machine of the same uh, uh, architecture as the underlying physical architecture. Okay. And the way it works is, the key observation is that most instructions executed by a VM, and by VM I basically mean the operating system that's running and the applications are unprivileged instructions. So a huge majority, 99.9% .9 or more of the instructions that get executed inside a virtual machine are instructions that are very regular in nature, like move, add, subtract, load, store, etc. Right? So these are very uh, regular instructions. These instructions would have had the same effect whether they are run in the user space or whether they, have, they run in the kernel space. And, um, and so these instructions, the emulation of these instructions can, uh, or the translation of these instructions can be made identity. So if, uh, if the guest, uh, so if the process, which I'm also going to call the guest, so the guest executes an instruction called an unprivileged instruction. I can just execute the same unprivileged instruction in the host and get the same behavior. Right? And so what you do is you uh, take the operating system and the applications, so guest op operating system and applications, and run it in unprivileged mode. Right? And the virtual machine monitor runs in privileged mode. Because most of the instructions are unprivileged in nature, when they execute, they just execute as though they are running natively. If they execute any privileged instruction, for example, if they try to access CR3, right? or if they try to execute an in instruction or an out instruction to access a device, you trap. Okay, just like, and then you emulate, just like you were doing in box and QMU, you emulate inside the VMM, and then you return. So what you do is you take, so consider this um, disk image of a virtual machine as your executable, right? That's the, that's the disk image that's basically, uh, that basically lives on your hard disk for a physical machine. That's a hard disk. So the hard disk is basically the executable. And so now this hard disk uh, in the virtual world is going to live in a file that's called, going to be called your virtual disk. And then you're going to run this virtual disk inside this container called the virtual machine. And this virtual disk is going to start running some instructions, one after another. What you're going to do is you're going to run these instructions, all these instructions in unprivileged mode. Even though these instructions were meant to, some of these instructions were meant to be run in privileged mode. For example, when you boot a machine, the first few instructions assume there's a privileged mode. Anytime you transition to the kernel, you assume that these instructions are running in the privileged mode. But the change you make is you run all these instructions in the unprivileged mode. Most of these instructions execute without any problem because most of these instructions are unprivileged instructions. Any instruction that's a privileged instruction, that must have been an instruction inside the guest OS kernel, will cause a trap, right? So you rely on some hardware properties that any, uh, which basically say that if you try to execute a privileged instruction in, and in unprivileged mode, you always get a trap. Right? So it causes a trap, and you, you handle the trap by emulating that instruction in software, just like you had done for Box or QMU. And then you return back to your guest. Right? So this kind of uh, a virtualization is called trap and emulate virtualization and significantly faster than either interpretation or binary translation. And you will, pro for something which is compute intensive, you will have less than 5% overhead for compute intensive applications. Okay. On the other hand, something that's very IO intensive it's very likely that you're going to be executing lots of privileged instructions. If the guest is trying to access lots of uh, you know, virtual devices, 
then it's probably executing lots of in and out instructions or something that's privileged. And anything that's privileged is going to cause a trap. It's going to uh, execute some emulation logic inside the virtual machine monitor and then return back. And so this extra overhead of doing this trap and emulation is going to become visible on IO intensive applications. So on an IO intensive application, you can have overheads of up to, let's say, 2 to 3x or 4x. You know, you could go back, get back to the QMU kind of performance for IO intensive applications. And this is just a basic trap and emulate style virtualization. There are many optimizations that can be done over it. And today, you know, with hardware support and all that, you can do virtual machine monitor, uh, virtual machines at almost negligible overhead. So what, what have we achieved? We basically have a process abstraction that looks very much like the hardware abstraction, and it runs with almost 0% overhead. Right? That was, you know, that's the whole idea of a process abstraction in the first place, right? The process should not be running too much, too much slower than, than, the, uh, than uh, when you're running it over the kernel as opposed to not running it over the kernel. OK? Is the VMM running on top of the kernel? Well, consider VMM as a part of the kernel. So VMM is, is a yet another subsystem inside the kernel, just like FS, virtual memory, drivers. There's yet another subsystem inside the kernel called the virtual machine monitor. Right? It's a relatively modern subsystem because you know virtualization is a relatively modern thing. It was it was very popular in the early days of computing in the 1960s when machines used to be really large, like the IBM mainframes, and used to be really expensive. So the only way to actually uh, make full use of these machines was basically lots of people sharing these machines. And at that time, virtual machines was a very popular concept and lots of research was done on you know, imp imp using, implementing fast virtual machines. Over the years, uh, computers became smaller, they became personal, things didn't have to be shared, computers didn't have to be shared, and so virtualized the, the, the technology of virtualization was lost. What do I mean by technology of virtualization was lost? The hardware interfaces were not, uh, were not virtualization compatible, for example, Recall that one of the requirements to implement this trap and emulate style virtualization is that if I run a privileged instruction in an unprivileged mode, it must trap. Right? So, but the hardware designers just didn't care about it because they thought these are personal computers. And similarly, the software stacks were not tuned for virtualization, etc. But it was rediscovered because now today, even though our hardware is relatively much cheaper, the cost of actually managing this hardware, which includes power, store, uh, power space, people who know how to manage these things, um, software ma maintenance, upgradation, security, viruses, etc. all these problems basically uh, make, you know, have, uh, have moved us back to a, cent uh, you know, have made the case for, a, again, a centralized computing uh, infrastructure that lots of people are sharing, and that's what we are calling cloud computing today, right? And so one of the building blocks of cloud computing is virtualization. So let's see why virtualization is helpful, or why you know why cloud computing is uh, is, uh, is is a is a useful thing. If you look at the utilization levels, so let's say this was time, and let's say this was utilization, All right? So wh what do I mean? Let let me take one any any one any one machine. Let's say let's take the ex uh, example of a web server. Let's take the example of the web server of, uh, of IIT Delhi, right? So if I look at the CPU utilization of IIT Delhi's web server, I'll probably see, you know, let's say this is, this is 100% and this is zero. Then it'll probably be somewhere like this. Sometimes there'll be a surge, there's some results are getting announced, and then there's, there's, there's like this, and then there's a surge again, let's say, et cetera. So this will be the typical uh, curve for CPU utilization of, uh, of a server. Same thing for, let's say, memory or disk, bandwidth or network. Right? So usually you will get some kind of behavior where, on average, the utilization levels of the machine are very low, but sometimes there is a very high surge in the demand and you get very uh, relatively higher utilization levels. And so what we typically do is we provision for the maximum. We try to provision for the maximum so that when there is a very high load, 
I don't see problems. But most of the time, this maximum is actually getting wasted. It may not, it, it's getting wasted because I'm probably consuming uh, a lot of power still. I'm consuming less power at 10% utilization than when, what I was consuming at 100%, but still I'm consuming uh, power. And I'm consuming the equal amount of space, definitely. And, uh, and so on, right? What would have been better was if I had, if I was able to run multiple machines on the same physical machine. So let's say I have, um, you know, I have the IATD's web server, and let's say I have mail server, which is, let's say, my department's mail server, the computer science department's mail server. And let's say it has behavior like this. Then these can easily be multiplexed on the same physical machine without seeing performance degradation on either application and yet having better utilization over for, for my physical machine overall, right? So virtual machines allow this, OK? And they allow this without having to worry about software compatibility. You may say, oh, what's the big deal? Why don't I just have one Linux machine and run the mail server as one process, my department's mail server as one process, and your, uh, your institute's web server as another process and let them you know, coexist and it's going to do exactly what you want it to do. But it's very difficult to, uh, because abstractions are so um, fragile, it's very difficult to ensure that the department's uh, web server can be run into, uh, on the same operating system as the uh, uh, institute's mail server without causing any problems with each other and without having any security implications. Right? So the department's web server may be less uh, critical than the institute's web server. And so you may want that, you know, they should be completely isolated from each other. It may, something may not be that carefully written, other thing may be carefully written. And because the abstractions of the, uh, of the Unix abstraction, let's say, are very fragile, you know, for example, the configuration files, etc. you know, they, these processes will depend on the configuration files, the slash etc folder, etc. it becomes a lot of, uh, it becomes a mess after a time to manage lots of different processes running on a sim 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 uh, single operating system. On the other hand, the virtual machine abstraction is very clean. It's the hardware abstraction. So I can just take one hardware abstraction and run it, and I, can, I, can not have to, I don't know how to worry about security problems or interference problems between these two virtual machines. OK. So what this allows me to do is basically, let's say, I have, this, this is a physical machine. Let me call it a physical host. And these are virtual machines. VM, VM, VM. This is another host. This is a VM. Right? So I'm, I'm showing you a cloud computing scenario. So what's, more, uh, what's called cloud computing in the modern world. So this is what a cloud computing environment will look like. You will have multiple physical hosts, and you would be running typically multiple virtual machines within a physical host. Typically, you, would be, you could, depending on the utilization levels of each VM, you, know, you could pack multiple VMs on the single, single host. It's very common to see tens of VMs packed on a single physical host, because, because the utilization levels of each of these VMs is very low. And so you could, you could be running these things together. The nice thing is, because these abstractions are so tight, I can at any time decide to move this virtual machine from here to here. Right? So this capability is what's called live migration. This can be done in a way such that the virtual machine has near zero downtime. Right? So it, it appears that the virtual machine never switched off. Right? So there's a, you know, one way to uh, show this is basically there's an interesting demo where let's say you're watching a movie on a virtual machine. A live migration happens, which means the, uh, the virtual machine shifts from one physical host to another. There is some amount of copying that's going on for all the memory state, et cetera. But it's all happening in the background. And at some point, the entire virtual machine shifts from one host to the other. And you do not see a blip in your, uh, in your movie. Right? So that's basically that's, that's what I mean by a near zero downtime live migration. So that's a very powerful capability. What it allows me to do is it basically allows me to dynamically schedule my work across my physical hosts at will. And that's one of the main strengths of cloud computing. Let's say I have 
you know, let's say these three VMs become very highly utilized suddenly. So I can choose to move this VM from here to here, right? So, or let's say it's, it's in the middle of the night and none of these VMs are actually using any resources at all. So I can pack all these VMs on a single physical host and actually switch off this particular physical host and say power, all right? Also, I can do fault tolerance, which basically means now your virtual machine state can be encapsulated as a file. So a running virtual machine can be snapshotted and, um, and its state can be preserved, its live state can be preserved as a file. And it can be loaded from where it was at will to basically get exactly what, how it was when it was snapshotted. Right? So that allows me to do fault tolerance. Fault tolerance basically means that if there was an error in either hardware error or a network error or a power failure, I can revert to the snapshot of a virtual machine and uh, basically get the same kind of behavior. So cloud computing has its advantages, basically, uh, that, that I've talk, talked about. But the more interesting thing from an operating system standpoint is that it brings open all the issues that we thought were dead for a long time. For example, scheduling now becomes a very important issue. Right? If you are running a cloud computing facility, if you're running a data center, then it becomes very important that you manage the data center with maximum utilization, and the maximum utilization depends on what scheduling algorithm you're using. Right? Unlike the personal computer uh, world where generally the hardware resources are plenty, in plenty, in a cloud computing environment, by definition, you're basically sharing these resources across lots of people, and you're minimize, trying to minimize your costs, so resources are never plenty. You're basically always trying to optimize your resources in some sense. All right, uh, okay, so with that, uh, we finish this course.